So Ohio voters turned out to make their voices heard yesterday on abortion rights. Voters in the red state chose to enshrine abortion rights in the state's constitution. Jerika Duncan is in Columbus with all the big results. Jerika, good morning. Good morning to you, Emery. You know, Democrats had several big victories, one of them obviously here in the state of Ohio when it comes to women's reproductive rights. Now, overall, women strongly backed this vote, and I want you to take a look at some numbers here. You'll notice that 80% uh, of, of people under the age of 30, both men and women, also voted in favor of this measure. That's according to a CBS News exit poll. Abortion rights advocates in Ohio erupted in celebration Tuesday night after the state voted to protect access to the procedure. I was crying tears of complete joy and shock and just overwhelmed. I was just overwhelmed that we can actually affect change. The past amendment called Issue 1 guarantees a woman's right to an abortion in the state's constitution. It allows for the procedure until fetal viability, usually around the 23rd week, but also makes exceptions for the mother's health. The impact of passing issue one will be felt throughout the state and for generations and generations to come. Since Roe v. Wade was overturned more than a year ago, abortion rights supporters have now prevailed in all seven states where the issue was on the ballot. The Supreme Court wanted to kick it back to the states. Well, we have taken on that mantle. Despite the loss, groups that oppose abortion rights vowed to continue their fight. We stand ready during this unthinkable time to advocate for women and the unborn just as we have always done. Ohio was the only state with abortion directly on the ballot. But future access will also be impacted by Tuesday's results in other places. Control for Virginia's state legislature was up for grabs as Republicans, who were pushing for a 15-week abortion ban, failed to flip the state Senate and lost control of the House of Delegates. Well, that didn't turn out exactly how I wanted it to. And in Kentucky's gubernatorial election, oh, the state's attorney general, Daniel Cameron, endorsed by former President Donald Trump, was defeated <laughs> by Democratic incumbent Andy Bashir. Tonight... Kentucky made a choice. A choice not to move to the right or to the left, but to move forward for every single family. Ohio's issue one will take effect in Ohio next month. President Biden praised the amendment's passage, saying voters rejected attempts to, quote, impose extreme abortion bans that put the health and lives of women in jeopardy. Emory. All right, so as you mentioned, since Roe v. Wade was overturned, abortion rights supporters have actually prevailed in most states where the issue was either on a ballot or perhaps top of mind, because like in Virginia, it was on a ballot, but perhaps they were thinking about it when they went to the polls. Um, is this something that could be considered a bellwether for 2024? Um, you know, when, when we're talking about other states looking at tweaking or changing their abortion rights laws. I think this is definitely a litmus test for the Republican Party, which, at least here in Ohio, was very adamant in terms of where they stand, and they wanted to vote down uh, this measure. When I spoke to the ACLU executive for Ohio, he said that, without a doubt, this is a flashpoint. People will be paying attention in terms of what to do next. But more importantly, what people are saying on the side of the issue who supported Amendment 1 is that the votes mattered, the people mattered. Uh, this mm -hmm. was something that was going to be dealt with at the legislative level, and those who wanted to defend this really felt like it should be in the hands of lawmakers. Those who wanted to protect the rights of women and reproductive rights were saying, no, let the people vote. Uh, they were out here campaigning three to one when you look at spending to make sure that the message was out there. There were conflicting and confusing messages in terms of what this actual amendment meant. So you had commercials, for instance, where there were a number of people uh, saying, you know, I'm pro-choice, but this goes too far. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was, you know, coming more from the Republican camp to try and get people to understand that their position was that the word health 
in life uh, was not clear enough. They feel mm -hmm. like health could mean the economic health, the mental health, the emotional health, which is what my conversation with the governor, Mike DeWine, Republican governor, said, is that he felt that it meant, based on his interpretation, that a woman could be eight or nine months pregnant and, and have an abortion. And saying, like, for Ohio, he felt it just went too far. But it will be a flashpoint. Other states, without a doubt, are taking a look at what voters want, not just um, across the country, but obviously within their states. Since the overturning of Roe v. Wade, this is now a state's issue. Yeah, it'll be really interesting. You know, the feeling was that the overturning of Roe v. Wade would sort of galvanize Democratic voters, encourage them to come out and vote. But then there were all these other issues that people are worried about. Inflation, uh, things happening overseas, uh, you know, just paying their bills. And so it, it's an interesting snapshot to see whether or not abortion rights uh, remains uh, an issue that ignites voters. Um, Drika, thank you very much. Um, the, res the results last night could be a, a sign of things to come for 2024. Robert Costa is joining us now to break it all down for us. So, Robert, there you are. Uh, we saw three major victories for Democrats, Ohio, Virginia, and Kentucky. Some might argue that the rejection of GOP candidates like uh, Daniel Cameron and the sweep of the Virginia legislature are also loosely tied to voter sentiment on abortion in Virginia. Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin endorsed a 15-week abortion ban. Do you think Republicans will, you know, take this as perhaps a wake-up call or, you know, maybe reconsidering their approach in terms of their messaging on abortion? It's good to be with you. So for the Republican Party, they have been disrupted by the overturning of Roe v. Wade ever since it happened. Talking to my Republican sources in the last 24 hours, it's evident that they're still trying to confront where should the party go from here. Many of those who support restricting abortion rights, they were very happy to see Roe v. Wade overturn. But the political fallout of that Supreme Court decision continues to cascade across the GOP, whether it was in the 2022 midterms or in these off-year elections in 2023. And as they look ahead to 2024, top Republicans in the country are wondering, maybe Republicans should put the issue a bit to the side when they're articulating their agenda to voters. Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin and Republicans in that state put the issue front and center, and it did not pay off for them politically. And it's, an, it's evidence for many Republicans that while there are, they believe many people across this country do support some restrictions on abortion rights, Roe v. Wade was really baked into the national consensus in other parts of the country, and they have to acknowledge that as they move forward politically. Yeah, it's really interesting, even sort of reading in on some of the coverage prior to yesterday's voting, some of the Democratic candidates actually didn't really mention abortion all that much. They sort of sat back and let the Democrats do the, or rather the Republican candidates, do the work for them. And it, it seems like that strategy may have worked, at least in some of these states. Um, I want to ask you about something, though, that Chris Christie said. Uh, some remarks from uh, pres Republican presidential candidate Chris Christie basically blaming Donald Trump for the losses on the Republican side. It's not a surprise that you would hear this from Chris Christie. This is basically, you know, part of what he's been campaigning on, kind of overtly criticizing Donald Trump. But I wonder if any of that holds water. We're going to have to pay close attention to the Republican presidential primary debate tonight in Miami, Florida. I'll be flying there in just an hour or so to get on the ground, and I'm going to be listening to see if former Governor Chris Christie's advice is taken by any of his fellow competitors in the race. Will they take on Trump and say that his political capital has diminished, he doesn't have the staying power, and he can't win? Or do they try to just talk about abortion and other issues and how they should be framed for 2024 and duck the question on Trump for the most part? And that's something that when it comes to talking to other campaigns who are not Trump campaigns, it's so clear to me that still, even in November of 2023, there's a reluctance to talk about Trump, a reluctance to go after Trump, because they believe the voters who have been with him for so long are still with him, and they want to win them over. And so they, their whole hope is that he collapses eventually rather than pushing him away. So, you know, you know about the recent uh, polling that we saw in some of these swing states where there was an indication that Donald Trump was sort of inching ahead of President Biden if there was a hypothetical sort of a one on one race. But some of the polling indicated that it was that people were less enamored with President Biden 
than it was that they disliked Donald Trump. And so I want to ask you about what that means for Democratic candidates. Yesterday on America Decides, Ed O'Keefe asked uh, Democratic representatives uh, Joyce ba Beatty of Ohio and Morgan McGarvey of Kentucky how they feel about, uh, you know, d uh, how they feel about the overall feeling that, that let me spit this out, how they feel about the unfavorable polls that are coming out. Um, I, I'm curious what you're hearing from other Democrats. When you look at what happened yesterday, for example, in Kentucky, Andy Bashir won re-election as a Democrat. He was running, for the most part, on President Biden's record in terms of how the Biden administration worked with states like Kentucky on issues like infrastructure, and other fronts and federal spending that was so crucial in that 2021 2022 period coming out of the pandemic and so people inside the biden white house have said well look andy Bashir won last night that's an example of bidenomics their economic framework for biden's economic record is working but you're right president biden in the polls continues to struggle uh, a recent poll with the new york times shows that he's behind trump in five of six crucial battleground states that biden won in 2020 but at the same time, I'm always cautious about polling a year out mm -hmm. because it reflects people's frustrations on certain issues, but it's not indicative of exactly where an election is going to go because at the end of the day, I've covered many presidential campaigns. It comes down to the choice between the Democratic nominee and the Republican nominee and sometimes some independent candidates. And people might detest one of them and they might detest both of them, but mm -hmm. it's going to be a choice and for Biden, the question sometimes is not just whether he can get Democrats to come back around. It's about making sure they show up. Showing up in enthusiasm is going to be an issue for any incumbent president as they look at their own party. You need to excite people to come out to the polls. That's why you could expect President Biden to get out there a bit more in the coming months. That's really interesting, Bob. Thank you very much. Thank you.